I want to invite you, if you're going to stay in big church with us today, if you'll take your bulletin, and if you would find the middle section, the verses of Scripture in the bottom right there inside the box, before we turn to the Scriptures for our sermon today, I want us to take just a moment to pray together. But would you read these verses of Scripture with me? This is from Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians 15. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. I'm going to invite you this moment, this morning, as we pray together, pray two things. One, a prayer of thanksgiving that you will share a resurrection like his. Jesus Christ was raised imperishable, immortal, and you will share in that resurrection. The second thing I would like for you to share, I don't know how many of you saw in the news this morning on the way to church in Sri Lanka, which is the island nation off the coast of India, as they were celebrating Easter services this morning, there were about three churches that were bombed, and about 150 of our brothers and sisters in Christ lost their lives as they were worshiping their risen Savior. So I want us to pray for God's grace upon them, and then I want us to ask God this morning to remind us why the cross is such good news that you would be willing to suffer for it. So would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for everything that Easter and Resurrection Sunday symbolizes and means and reminds us of, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave. We thank you for this glorious promise that we will share in a resurrection like yours and this mortal body must be laid down so that we can take up that which is immortal we thank you for that promise and the hope that promise and hope becomes very important particularly for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Sri Lanka as they grieve this morning We struggle to even know what to pray for them. We pray for your grace that you would be the comfort for those who are grieving. We pray that you would be their good shepherd who walks with them through the valley of shadows. We pray that you would remind them of the hope of the resurrection. This is why they gather together on Easter Sunday to celebrate for this very reason. And that somehow you would give them the heart that you gave the disciples in Acts who were, who considered themselves blessed because they were counted worthy to suffer for your name. And we certainly pray that in that nation, in that region, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up because of these events. That the Christ, the cross and the Christ would be proclaimed in that nation And many would come to saving faith as a result of their witness. Father, as we turn to the scriptures, I pray that you would remind us today of why the gospel is such good news. And why it would compel anyone to give their life away. And to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow you. Father, I I pray for an anointing of your spirit to proclaim the gospel this Easter morning and that you would give us ears to hear. And it's in Christ's name that we pray.
You know, we live in a very visual age. How many of y'all are Instagram fans and Facebook, social media? We always love pictures and images. And we live in a marketing age as well. So in a marketing age, in a visual age, when you are trying to promote your company, it's very important to have a visual image, a visual representation, a logo, if you will, that represents your company so that everybody can instantly identify it, know what it stands for, but also be drawn to it and want to participate in it. So if you're golf fans and you watched the uh, Masters last Sunday or had it recorded or whatever and saw Tiger Woods walking down the 18th fairway with his signature red shirt on and on his shoulder was... Did anybody watch golf or anybody? The swoosh, right? The Nike symbol. Nike sales spiked the next three days after the Masters because of he was wearing the swoosh. I could hold up a piece of apple with a bite out of one particular side, and all of you instantly would know the company I'm talking about, right? I could show you a circle of kind of a green mermaid kind of looking thing that none of us really know exactly what it means, but we know there's coffee not very far away, right? Uh, instantly, the golden arches you recognize, the silhouette of a mouse you recognize, right, all of that. It's important. Companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this right. You want a logo that presents your image, but also is inviting. You want people to be willing to walk down the 18th fairway at Masters with a shirt wearing your logo on their chest. So let me ask you this question. If you were starting a brand new religious movement, you were starting Christianity. What would you choose to be the logo of Christianity? What would you choose to be the image that would proclaim the essence of what the Christian gospel means, but also would be very attractive, very winsome, and would even want people to proclaim it and wear it and identify it? What would the perfect logo for Christianity be? Well, we know from archaeologists that found very early on when Christians were buried in in the tombs, in the caves, they would etch into the wall the sign of the fish. You've seen the little simply drawn fish. And the reason is the Greek word for fish, ichthus, makes a perfect an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Take the first letter of all those words, put them together, and it spells the word fish. Combine one of Jesus' greatest miracles. He fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fish. And you've got the perfect marketing image for Christianity. The fish, but as you and I know, the fish is not the logo that stuck for the Christian gospel. About by the second century, the logo that has stuck for Christianity is the logo of the cross. Now, I know you and I are so accustomed to that today. We see it all over. It makes perfect sense to us. But you have to realize the cross was a barbarian instrument of execution. It was specifically created to be the most cruel way to put someone to death. It was designed to delay the moment of death to as long as possible so you could squeeze out the last bit of torture upon that person before they die. It was so horrible. One of the benefits of Roman citizenship is a Roman citizen could not be crucified. Uh, so Cicero, the Roman politician, said to bind a Roman citizen is a crime to flog a Roman citizen's abomination, to kill a Roman citizen's an act of murder, but to crucify a Roman citizen? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. Crucifixion wasn't even acceptable, polite dinner conversation. I mean, you couldn't be around the table going, hey, did you see the crucifixion last Friday? I mean, you just didn't do that. It was, it was totally out of bounds. You didn't talk about it. So why did Christians choose such a horrible logo for their faith? I mean, can you imagine if I unveiled our new logo, FBC Benbrook's new logo, and for the image I picked a hangman's noose, or old Sparky, the electric chair. I mean, you'd be looking at me like, what are you thinking? You've lost your mind. Why would you choose an instrument of execution to be our church logo? But that's exactly what they did. Why is the cross the logo for Christianity? Archaeologists have found a, an ancient Roman home. They think it's dated about 200 A.D., so what, 160 years after the crucifixion. And in the plaster of one of those walls, there is a very primitive etching into the plaster of a cross. 
And on the cross is drawn a very crude picture of a man with the head of a donkey. And beside it is another very simple drawing of a man with his hand raised. And under it is the words, Alexamos worships God. So it's, it's ancient graffiti making fun of Alexamos because he worships a donkey head God who's on a cross, but also making fun of Christianity. Christianity, this God who hung on the cross. That's, so the, the idea of the, the logo for being the cross to be offensive and something full of ridicule, no one would want to identify with it. Why didn't the Christian movement find a better icon? Why not the empty tomb? Why not the manger? Why not a dove? All sorts of things you can think of, but why the cross? Because the simple answer is, is what happened on the cross is the heart and the soul of the gospel message. So this month we are talking about the atonement. The atonement is the way in which we are made at one with God. The at one with sinners are reconciled to God. This is a word that was really kind of made up by William Tyndall. William Tyndall was the first to translate the Bible from the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into the English language, early 1500s. And he kind of made up the word atonement to capture this idea of being reconciled with God. We are at one with God. And so to talk about the atonement, you talk about the cross. Last week we talked about this question, why did Jesus have to die on the cross for our sins to be forgiven? How come he couldn't just love us like grandma does and out of his love just say, oh honey, don't worry about that. And so we read from Romans 5 where the love of God and the wrath of God are brought together. And so the wrath of God is God's holy response to evil. And so the cross, the is God's holy, the requirement of sin, and God's love is the payment of sin. And you add those two together, you end up with the cross. Next week, when we talk about the atonement, we're going to talk about the effects of the atonement. In other words, how does the cross that happened 2,000 years ago continue to impact your life today? Or does it? Was it just a historical event that we look back at and sing songs about but have nothing to do with our life today? Or is there something that continues to impact our life because of the cross? That's next week. But today the question I wanna, want you to think on with me is this question. What exactly happened on the cross? What exactly happened on the cross? And I know you, you may be looking at me and saying, Wait a minute, isn't this Easter Sunday? It's Resurrection Sunday. Aren't we supposed to be talking about the empty tomb? Why are you three days earlier talking about the cross? And believe me, I have wrestled with that question this week as well. As, as the sermon was coming together and really thinking, really, God, this is the sermon for Easter Sunday. We're going to continue to talk about the cross. But I was reminded the empty tomb really doesn't mean anything if the cross didn't mean anything. I mean, we do not have an annual holiday that we celebrate the empty tomb of Lazarus. Right? Lazarus was in the grave for four days, not three days. Jesus raised him from the dead. But we don't celebrate, we don't celebrate the resurrection of Lazarus because his death didn't mean anything. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because his death meant something. So what exactly happened on the cross? And get that, I would like you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you want to read the same translation I'm reading, it's in your bulletin notes. The embarrassment of preaching Jesus with the cross or having the logo as being the cross was, you know, an early problem for the church. The graffiti there and that plaster wall and that old Roman home uh, indicates that. It would have been much easier to preach Jesus with something else. I mean, why start off with the cross, an offensive, silly symbol like that? Why not go in with the love of God or why not go in with the manger or something a little more friendly? But Paul... When he went to Corinth for the first time on the second missionary journey, and he said, when I, when I went to Corinth to preach Jesus, I determined to preach nothing other than the crucifixion. You think about that. That's the best way I can tell these people about Jesus. He focuses on the crucifixion. I determined to know nothing but the crucifixion. So I invite you to read with me. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just follow along with me as I read. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the, wise, the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. 
So where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews, it's foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Essentially, in this whole paragraph, Paul talks about the word of the cross. The, uh, the word in Greek for word is the word logos. It's where we get our word logo from. A logo is an image that proclaims a message. So here he's saying that the logo of Christianity is the cross, but it is folly. It is foolishness. This word means intellectually weak. It means irrational. We might use the word embarrassing. Or one of our favorite phrases nowadays is on the wrong side of history. Right? The, the word of the cross is on the wrong side of history. We need to get on the right side of history. He realizes that it is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. And notice it's present tense. So the scripture talks about we have been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. We are being saved, it's the power of God. He begins to hint that the power of God has continual impacts on our life. And we'll talk about that next week. And then he asks in verse 20, where's the wise person? This is the philosopher. Where's the scribe? This is the religious teacher. Where's the debater of this age? That word means someone who is skilled in arguing. So the New Living Translation should say, where's the blogger? I made that up. Anyway, it's but verse 21, do you notice what it says? The wisdom of the world cannot know God. The wisdom of this world cannot know God because the cross is irrational, it is unwise, it is illogical, and it doesn't make any sense. I wish I could share with you just some of the things I've read this week about what people say about the cross, and you may have heard some of these things. That it was a barbaric for a loving God to require a human sacrifice. That God the Father requiring the death of the Son was basically divine child abuse. You heard that? The notion that guilt can be transferred from one person to another is incompatible with reasonable justice. Or this one, from a seminary professor no less, and I quote, His death accomplished nothing for the salvation of sinners. When Paul says the wisdom of this world cannot know God, this is what he is talking about. The message of the cross is foolishness. The message of the cross is illogical. It doesn't make sense. Through the wisdom of this world, you'll never get to what the cross means. And there are those who demand signs, want wisdom. And Paul says in the midst of all that, we preach Christ. And he even admits Christ is a stumbling block. There are people who who cannot come to faith in Jesus because they can't get over the cross. And Paul, instead of saying, so I've decided to preach Jesus with a different way. I'll talk about the cross later, but I'm going to talk about the love of God or the golden rule or heaven or something else. That's not what Paul said. He said, I determined to preach Christ. Even though it's a stumbling block, we preach Christ crucified. It is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. So let me ask you again, what exactly happened on the cross? Here it is in a sentence. What happened on the cross is that God substituted himself to bear the penalty of our sin so that we can be reconciled with him. Let me say that again. God substituted himself to bear the penalty of our sin so that we can be reconciled with him. You want your theological phrase for the day? Here it is. Substitutionary atonement. Substitution, God substituted himself for us Atonement to be reconciled with God. So again, God substituted himself to bear the penalty of our sin so that we can be reconciled with him. Substitutionary atonement. And God in his wisdom knew we would never get that just by looking at the cross. We would never understand through our wisdom what happened on the cross. So God has been preparing humanity from the dawn of time to understand the cross. I could take you today and we could just flip through pages of the scriptures beginning with the, uh, 
the index and going all the way through the maps, and we could just talk about how God is preparing his people to understand the cross. But let me just hit some of the highlights for you, okay? Passover. God's people are enslaved in Egypt, and God's going to redeem them out of Egypt. And so he sends plagues so that the king of Egypt will want to kick them out of, Israel, kick them out of Egypt, but he won't let them go. And so the tenth plague is going to be the worst plague. It's the death of the firstborn. God says, I'm going to pass over Egypt, and the firstborn of all humans, animals, is going to die that night, except for my people who believe in me and trust in me. If they will take a lamb, and they'll take the blood of the lamb and put it over the door of their house, when I pass through Egypt, I will pass over that house. The blood of the lamb saves them from the judgment and wrath of God. God takes his people out of Egypt, and he comes to Mount Sinai, he enters into a covenant with them. He calls Moses up to the mountain, and he gives the covenant. Moses, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to dwell right in the midst of you, and here's my laws of everything that I expect you to do, but I know you won't be able to follow all of them, so when you fail, when you sin, this is how we can be reconciled. You take a lamb, and you bring it to the tabernacle. Lay your hands on that lamb. Confess your sins, and your sins will be transferred to that lamb, and that lamb will be a substitute and will pay the price of your sin, and here's the key word in Leviticus 1, and I will accept it as atonement for you. Blood of the Lamb saves us from the judgment of God. Blood of the Lamb is a substitute for our sins and our guilt so that we can be reconciled with God. Later on in Leviticus uh, is the Day of Atonement, that day once a year when a high priest takes two goats One goat is sacrificed for the sins of the nation. The other goat, the high priest lays his hands and confesses all of the sins of Israel upon this goat. And they take the goat out into the wilderness and they send the goat out of the wilderness. It's called the scapegoat. And it carries the sins away. Blood of the lamb saves us from the wrath of God. The lamb is our substitute. It pays our price so that we can be reconciled with God. The goat, the sin offering goat, takes away our sins. And so the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53, that great passage, I put it there in your bulletin, begins to connect those dots, and he talks about the coming Messiah as the Lamb of God who will take away our sins, that God will lay upon him the iniquity of us all, that he will be pierced for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. And then you have Jesus at the Lord's Supper, and what does he do? He takes the cup and he says, this cup is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. And so the New Testament, the apostles who spent time with Jesus, as they go out and they preach the gospel, this is how they preach Jesus. Paul calls Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, Jesus is our Passover lamb. The book of Hebrews, which is basically the New Testament commentary in the book of Leviticus, identifies Jesus as both the once and for all sacrifice and the goat that takes our sins away. Identifies both as the Passover lamb. And and the apostles use Isaiah 53 to preach Jesus over and over and over again. The understanding has always been this idea of substitutionary, atoning death of Jesus Christ. Peter preaches it this way. 1 Peter 2, He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. John said, He laid down his life for us. Paul said, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The heart and soul of the gospel is the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ. That's what happened on the cross. Listen to all the hymns that you sing, because hymn writers have been singing of this for years. It is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but in whole, has been nailed to the tree in what? I bear it no Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. The substitutionary atoning death of Jesus for our sins is the logo of Christianity because it is the heart and soul of the Christian gospel. Now again, I know you're looking at me today and thinking, why are we spending so much time on this on Easter Sunday? It's empty tomb day and it's resurrection Sunday. And believe me, I've wrestled with this this week, but I believe God has called me to preach this message for these two words. Because the cross is the wisdom of God, and because the cross is the power of God. The cross is the wisdom of God. I mean, you may be listening to all this and saying, doesn't everyone believe that what happened on the cross 
is the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ? Doesn't everyone believe that's what happened on the cross? And the answer is no. This is what Paul is saying. The world in its wisdom is not able to figure out the cross because it's foolishness to them. The message of the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus is, in fact, not obvious. I mean, the Jews reject the death of Jesus as the atoning death, right? The Muslims reject the death of Jesus as the substitutionary atoning death. They believe you can be made right with God by good works and following the five pillars of Islam. The Hindus and the Buddhists reject the atoning death of Jesus. They follow reincarnation and karma. So that's two-thirds of the world right there. But increasingly what is disturbing is more and more of people who, who identify as Christians are rejecting the idea of the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ. A guy named Socinus in the 1500s, this is what he wrote. The notion that guilt can be transferred from one person to another was incompatible with both reason and justice. It was not only impossible, but unnecessary. Can you imagine anyone calling themselves a Christ follower saying the cross was unnecessary? And I know you don't know the name of Socinus, but his ideas and his beliefs have been echoing for the last 2,000 years. A couple years ago, an Anglican bishop in England on an Easter Sunday radio broadcast described the traditional teaching of the crucifixion, which is the substitutionary atoning death of Christ. He called it, quote, repulsive. And he said it made God seem like a psychopath. And he said, what sort of God was this getting so angry with the world and the people he created and then to calm himself down by demanding the blood of his own son? Why should God forgive us through punishing someone else? It's an Anglican bishop on his Easter Sunday radio broadcast. Recently I read from a former professor at Union Theological Seminary. She said, I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dripping and weird stuff like that. I I could read you long lists and quotes of, of professors at seminaries, Christian seminaries, who are denying and rejecting the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ because to them it doesn't make sense, it's illogical, it's offensive, it is foolishness. So yes, on Easter Sunday morning, I want my congregation to know. I want the congregation that God has given to me and entrusted me to preach the gospel to. I want the students who grow up in this church to understand very clearly what happened on the cross. I want the community of Benbrook to understand what happened on the cross, that Christ died for our sins, that we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son, that we are justified by His blood, that the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus is the heart and soul of the gospel, and it is God's wise plan to reconcile you to Himself. There is no other way. And you say, well, surely everyone believes that. No, it needs to be proclaimed year after year after year so that the church in America does not cease to be a Christian church. Because the heart and soul of the gospel is the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ. But more importantly this morning, I think God has called me to preach this because not only is the cross the wisdom of God, the cross is the power of God. It's the power of God. It's the power of God to do what? To reconcile you with God. But it's also the power of God to take away your sins. Let me ask you this question this morning. If the blood of Jesus does not take away your sins, then what has become of your sin? Where is it now? Leon Morris in his book, The Cross, put it this way. If Christ is not my substitute then I still occupy the place of a condemned sinner. And if my sins and my guilt are not transferred to Him, and if He did not take them upon Himself, then surely they remain with me. And if my penalty was not borne by Him, it still hangs over me. See, if we reject the idea of the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus, then what becomes of our sin? I mean, we could try to just wash it away. We'll say, well, God loves us. God just looks at us and says, oh, honey, don't worry about that. Or, or that sin is not that big of a deal. Or we can be good enough. Or God's not that holy of a God. But here's the problem with that is none of that washes away the objective sense of our guilt as sinners. 
And by the objective sense of our guilt as sinners, what I'm talking about is this awareness, this reality that we all have, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can try your best to deny that, but I think deep in the human soul, we all know that. We don't really even need people to tell us that. I've heard people say, well, I don't want to go to church because all, the church just makes people feel guilty. That's all we do. And I'm sure that's probably true of some churches. But look around. Nobody's abandoning the counselor's office. Therapist's offices are full. Why? Because we know we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The bars are full. The bars are full of people self-medicating. Why? Because they know they have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's this objective guilt that they deal with. The world around us is chasing fun through sexual immorality and earthly riches, all trying to wash away and mask the pain of their guilt because we know we are guilty. There is this objective reality of our sin. And the good news of the gospel is the only thing that can wash away our sins is the blood of Jesus. It's the power of God. The old hymn says, what can wash away my sins? Not alcohol, and not therapy, and not good works, certainly not religion, not a vacation, not prison. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I proclaim the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus on Easter Sunday because it is the power of God for those who are being saved. And it alone has the power of God to wash away our sins. So on a today when you are at lunch with someone who we went to another church and what did your pastor preach on? And they say, oh, the empty tomb. And they look at you and say, what did your pastor preach on? The cross for some reason, I don't know. And, and they look at you and say, well, why did he talk about the cross on Easter Sunday? This, I hope, will be your answer. Because the empty tomb only matters because of what happened on the cross. And the cross is the wisdom of God to reconcile us to himself. And it is the power of God to wash away our sins. And because of that, the empty tomb has meaning. Remind you in verse 21 of what Paul wrote. It pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. Perhaps the Holy Spirit today is calling you to the wisdom of God. In your wisdom, you've been thinking of another way that you're going to be made right with God. You're just going to be a good person, or you're just going to trust the fact that a good God wouldn't send anybody to hell, or that you haven't done anything bad enough to deserve hell. And, and that's kind of what you're trusting on in your wisdom, because that makes sense to you. And perhaps today, the wisdom of God has been revealed to you, that in the wisdom of God, the one way that you can be reconciled to God is through what happened on the cross. Or perhaps God is calling you today to the power of God. Power of God. We, we all have this objective sense of our sin. We all know that we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what do we do to get that washed away and to be cleansed from that? And maybe you've just been trying to do more good works or trying to be a better person. Or, but it just keeps hanging on. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of the cross can wash away your sins. Paul says, to save those who believe. What does it mean to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? It means you come to that place where you realize that you are a sinner and you deserve the wrath of God because you've rebelled against Him and you were an enemy. But you believe that Jesus is God's Son who died on the cross for your sins. God was substituting Himself on the cross so that you could be reconciled to Him and you believe that this is the only way that I made right with God. And you come to that place where you confess Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. I love verse 24. To those who are called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Is God calling you today? Is God calling you to saving faith? Is God calling you today to say, I, I trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I trust in the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus on the cross to be reconciled with him. Would you join me as we pray together?